Hi, and welcome to the second RNAC online seminar. And today we will talk a little bit about what in molecular biology is known as the central dogma, which is an explanation of the flow of genetic information within a biological system. So it's a transfer of information from the DNA to a protein. And this central dogma is composed of two blocks. The first one is where we transfer the information from the DNA to a messenger RNA. And this is what it's called the transcription process. And then the second block of the central dogma is where we transfer the information from the RNA to a protein. And this is what it's called the translation. So let's start with the transcription. So what exactly is the transcription? The transcription is the first step in gene expression. And in transcription, the DNA sequence of the gene is copied to make an RNA molecule with the help of an enzyme, the RNA polymerase. And this step, it's called transcription because it, it involves uh, like rewriting or transcribing the DNA sequence in, we could say like a similar alphabet, which is the RNA. And I say similar because we all know that in the DNA, what it reads, it's the nuclear basis. There are basically four the adenine, the guanine, the cytosine, and then the thymine. And in the RNA, we have also four nucleate bases, but instead of the thymine, we have a neural cell. And so the transcription um, is composed of different steps, and in both bacteria and eukaryotic cells, um, has three common steps, which are the initiation step, the elongation, and the termination. And then also only in the eukaryotic cells, we have an extra step, which is the processing. So let's start with the initiation step and imagine that we have a DNA with um, both strands interaction, interacting with each other through complementary bases. And within this DNA, we can find some regions that are called promoters. And so what exactly is this a promoter? So this promoter is this region in the DNA that contains several sequences that the RNA polymerase is able to recognize. So in the initiation process, what happens is that the RNA polymerase detects and recognizes these sequences in the promoter and is able to bind it. So it attaches to the DNA. And when it attaches, to the DNA, what happens is it creates kind of like a pressure and it is able to break all the interactions between the complementary bases and create an opening. So separate both strands from the DNA. And so here it will start the elongation phase. So we know that in the DNA we have two strands and one of each we, it's what we call the coding DNA, which contains all the necessary information to synthesize the protein that we want. And then this second one is what we call the template DNA, which is the one that the RNA polymerase is going to use to create the RNA sequence. So the RNA polymerase by itself can create the RNA sequence at invasives only in the three terminus side. Then, what exactly is happening? How does it do it? Well, it starts adding the complementary bases from the template DNA. And as we can see here, if we take a closer look in the RNA, now that it's been synthesized, contains the exact same information that the code in DNA, which contains the information that we want to synthesize the protein. Yes, of course, we have the aerosol instead of the timing, but essentially the information is the same one. And so this, the RNA polymerase um, starts building this RNA sequence until when, how does it stop? So the same way that it is capable to recognize the sequence within the promoter, it also recognizes the stop sequences that tell her to stop. And here we can um, go more into in deep, between the differences between the bacteria and the eukaryotes. But basically, in a general sense, we all know that um, the RNA polymerase already, um, when it reaches these, these stop sequences, then 
um, stops adding any more nuclear bases. And also sometimes it is, it is added to the fact that the RNA sequence usually um, suffers a conformational change and sometimes creates an R pin, which contributes to the instability of the complex and helps the RNA polymerase to release the RNA chain. So is this RNA sequence already the messenger RNA? Well, for bacteria, yes. It is, and this will start, continue with the translation process. However, with eukaryotes, as I said before, we need another step. So this is what we call the pre-messenger RNA. And why is that? Well, as we all know, we, between bacteria and eukaryotic cells, we have a lot of differences. And the main one is that bacteria doesn't have a nucleus. So the transcription process takes place in the cytosol. And then the translation process takes place in the ribosome, which is already in the cytosome. However, in the eukaryotic cells, we do have a nucleus where we keep the DNA sequence. Therefore, the transcription take, takes place there. However, the translation also takes place in the ribosome. So the RNA has to cross the, membrane, the membranes of the nucleus and go into the cytosome. And here it's what we need the processing. And we need it for two reasons. The first one is because we want, we want to make sure that when, we, when the RNA chain transfers and traspasses the membranes, we don't lose any information and it doesn't break. So in a way, we have to protect this RNA sequence. So that's the first reason. And then the second one is, as we all know, the DNA of from an eukaryotic cells, it's much more complex and has much more information than the one in the bacteria. So in a way, we have to filter this information because not all of this is useful to synthesize our protein. So this would be the second reason. So the processing step is if we have our RNA sequence, then the cell incorporates a cap, which is a modified guanidine that protects the transcript from being broken down. And it also helps the ribosome to detect the RNA sequence and helps to start the translation process. And then on the three terminus side, it adds a poly A tail, which also helps with the stability and helps the RNA to get exported from the nucleus to the cytosome. So these two steps contribute to the first aim of the processing, which is to protect the RNA change and so that it doesn't break when, we, when it transfers the nuclear membranes. But then the other reason is that we do have a lot of information inside of the RNA sequence, and we have what it's called the exons, which are the sequences that have the essential information to synthesize the protein, but we also have other regions that are not as essential for the protein, and it's what they are called introns. So here it's what, it starts the splicing process. And it's called the splicing because the enzyme responsible for it, it's called the spliceosome. So this enzyme, what, what it does is to cut all the introns and put together all the exons. So at the end, we only get the information that we really need to synthesize the protein. So this would be what we will have now, which is our information all the exons with the poly A tail and then the cap. And this is already the, a messenger RNA. However, sometimes what can happen is that we can have not all the exons, but a variety of this, maybe three or two, or a lot of more, like a lot of more choices. And each of them is their own messenger RNA. And each of them will then have information from different proteins. So at the end, we will have a pool of variety of RNA messengers. So where are we now? Now we are in both bacteria and eukaryotic cells here in the messenger RNA. So the transcription process is finished. And now we want to transfer this information to synthesize the protein. So we start with the translation process. So the translation is the process where the information carried in the messenger RNA molecule is used to create the proteins. And more specifically, it always encodes a polypeptide. 
And why do I say always encodes a polypeptide and not a protein? Well, because one protein can be form of one polypeptide chain. However, there are some more complex proteins that can be composed of several polypeptide chains. And the translation, strictly talking, says that um, it only encodes for one polypeptide chain that then it can fold and be a protein or can interact with our polypeptide chains and then create a more complex protein. And as I said before, this process takes place in the ribosome and also is composed of different steps, an initiation, elongation, and a termination step. But before we go um, into the process, I want to talk to you a little bit about the genetic code because the ribosome will read the sequence of the messenger RNA in groups of three nucleate bases, which are called codons. Each pack of three bases, it's called a codon. And if we know we have four bases, so we have a lot of combinations more than amino acids. So it is normal to know that one amino acid can be encoded by different codons. For example, here we can see that all of these four codons will encode for a proline, or here the same with a serine. And also we have some codons that will not encode for any amino acid, which are the known as the stop codons. And this will help tell the ribosome where to stop the translation. And also, if we have these stop codons that tell us where to stop, we also have one starting codon, which is the AUG that always encodes with a methionine. And it's the starting point of the translation. And which are the essential elements that we need in the translation process? Well, first of all, obviously the messenger RNA, because if we don't have the messenger RNA, we don't have the information to create the protein. Also the ribosomes, which provide uh, the structure in which the translation can take place. And also um, they catalyze the reaction that links the amino acids to make the new protein or the new polypeptide chain. And as we can see, in this picture, it has two subunits that come together in the translation around the RNA messenger. And each of these subunits has a different, a different function that we will say. Then we also need the transfer RNAs, which carry the amino acids to the ribosome and actually are the ones responsible, responsible to read the sequence of the RNA and also obviously the amino acids to create the polypeptide chain. So how's the process? First, um, we have the initiation step where the initiation complex has to be formed. So here in a simple ways, what happens is that the transfer RNA initiator, which is the one that encodes for methionine, um, interacts with this small subunit of the ribosome and bind each other, create like a mini complex. And then the, minis, the small unit of the ribosome recognizes the cap, the modified guanidine that we had put in the processing step of the transcription. And then it attaches to it and starts reading the sequence of the RNA messenger until it finds the starting codon which is the AUG. So what happens is it binds to it. And as we can see here, this would be the one that represents a transfer RNA, which contains also three bases, which are called the anticodon because they are complementary to the codon that will encode for the amino acid. So when it is bound, then the bigger subunit of the ribosome will attach and this will create the first starting complex. And as we can see in the ribosome, we have three sites, the H site, the P site, and the E site, that we will see what are their functions. So now we will step into the elongation process, which is to create the polypeptide. And how does it happen? Well, as we can see here, we have free, the A site, and this A site attracts the transfer RNA that has the anticodon complementary to the following codon. 
And in this case, it encodes for a serine. So what happens next? It attaches to the eight side, and then the serine and the methionine interact and make a bind, a bond. They interact with each other. And so when they have done this bond, the ribosome moves one position forward to the RNA messenger sequence, and then now we have the, trans, the A site again free. And so what happens next is that the binding between the methionine and the transfer RNA is done. So they break this bond and then the complex exits the, and releases the transfer RNA through the E site. And so what we have now is in the P site, a polypeptide of two amino acids. And this starts again. Now we have free the position of the H site that will attract the transfer RNA with the anticodon corresponding to the following codon. Then both amino acids will interact. The ribosome will move forward one position. Then the bond between the serine and its transfer RNA will break and then the complex will release the transfer RNA. So now we will have the polypeptide of three amino acids. And this goes on and on and on until when? Well, until in the eighth side, we have the stop codon. So what happens here is that the transfer RNA containing the anticodon of the stop codon attaches to the A side. However, here, it doesn't encode to any amino acid, so we don't have any amino acid here. So there's no bond that can be made here. So the ribosome move forward one, one position and then liberates the polypeptide. And so in, it releases all the polypeptide chains that obviously the transfer RNA will also um, be released from it. And then this polypeptide chain, what it will do can either fold itself and create a protein or interact with others and then fold all together and create another kind of protein with the help of some enzymes like chaperones and then also comes with a regulation process, which I think uh, Rosvita will tell us you about tomorrow. And so in here we will already have all the process. So, Let's do a summary of the transcription and the translation, really quick, really quick. So we have in the transcription, the DNA with a promoter that it's recognized with the RNA polymerase, and this creates an opening and separates both chains. Then the RNA polymerase starts creating and synthesizing the RNA sequence, and then when it reaches the stop, it, it is released from the complex, and then from the bacteria, this is already the messenger RNA. And for the eukaryotes, we have to do the processing, which involves protecting our DNA, our RNA, and then selecting also only the exons. And so once we have the messenger RNA, then we have the creating of the initial complex of the ribosome, and then the first transfer will arrive to the A site and create a bond with the other amino acid. And then we will move forward one position and break the bond with the transfer RNA. And this will be released. And then we will be creating the polypeptide in the B site that will go on until we find a stop codon. And then here it will be released without adding any more amino acid. And then this will again either fold or interact with others and create the protein. And finally, before, um, before finishing, I wanted to give you five cents, that something that we already almost all know, but since we will have to perform several mutations in our project, so it's good to give you five, five cents, especially for the computational guys. So a mutation is any change in the sequence of the DNA encoding a gene and it can be spontaneous or induced. And in our case, we will do induced mutations. So just uh, to give you five cents of some types of the mutation of some effects that can be done. So 
we can either have selections where it changes the number of DNA bases by removing a piece of DNA, where you can remove either one base or a piece of DNA more large. And this might alter the function of the resulting proteins. We can either have collections and we can also have insertions, which um, changes the number of the bases by adding a piece of DNA, either if it needs one base or more bases. And this can also affect to the function. Also, we can have substitutions of different bases that this can have a major or a minor effect on the function of the protein. Then we can either have also duplications of several regions between the sequence, also inversions, where we have one sequence that gets turned 180 degrees. So it will alter the order of the bases, and this can also be really compromising. And also we can have frame shifts, which are a consequence of deletions and insertions. So basically what happens is if we have this sequence, we will have these codons encoding. But then if we have a deletion here, then the codons, as you can see, change. And this can also be really, really, this can also really affect the protein or the function. And so what effects can we find? So I thought this was going to be easier with an example. So imagine that we have the sequence of the DNA. This is the normal without any mutation. Then the RNA will encode this. And this um, is a codon that will encode for a lysine. It, you can have a silent effect, which you can have a change in the DNA sequence. So also a change in the RNA messenger. But as we saw before, we have several codons that encode for the same amino acid. So here it should, it's one of these cases where the protein is not affected because we still have the same amino acid. But then we have the missense where this is where it changes the codon and it changes in a, to a point that the amino acid also changes. So this can be really, really, um, really catastrophic in, to the point that maybe um, this amino acid was crucial um, to the good conformation of the protein. So now it's not, not at all stable, so it cannot correctly fold. Or if it's amino acid that it's uh, a key point to the interaction with the ligand. So um, it can cause uh, different, different problems. And also we have the nonsense where here, instead of changing the amino acid, we have um, a codon that it's a stop codon. So here we will not have any amino acid. And the fact is that the translation will stop. So we will not have all the information for the protein. So basically we will not have any, pro any protein. And so that's it. And I put here some useful pages where I got inspired from the like the animations and stuff that it's really useful for the computational stuff, not only in this topic, but also in many other topics. So it, maybe it's useful for all of you. And that's it. <laughs>